This video is sponsored by Squarespace. More about them later. I did a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Black 2 using only Dittos. In a Nuzlocke, if a Pokemon faints in battle, it's dead forever. And for this challenge, every time I catch a Pokemon on a new route, my Uncle Jim Tendo will turn it into a sentient blob of pinkish purple paste through the process known as Pokemon Kinetic Heat Exchange, or PK Hex for short. With Jimmy's help, I'll have an arsenal of Dittos each ready to lay down their life for the noble cause of becoming champions of the Unova League. Is this even possible? I have no idea. For those of you who have never used Ditto as anything more than a foreign exchange student forced into becoming a Fury Road-esque breeding machine so that you can feel your obsession with shiny Pokemon, let's break down what makes Ditto the cream of the crop. The crop in this case being sucking. Ditto's only claim to fame is their ability to transform into an enemy Pokemon. Their hidden ability Imposter, which Uncle Jim graciously gave every member of my Ditto army, allows them to transform immediately as they hit the field. Once transformed, Ditto's will be a nearly identical copy of the enemy Pokemon, including their stats, ability, and learned moveset. The only exception to this is that Ditto will keep their HP stat, which off of a base stat of 48 is pretty lousy compared to most fully evolved Pokemon. So essentially, in order to win this playthrough, I'll need to beat every trainer in the game with cheap clones of their own team. We do have a few things working in our favor though. A, I can choose which item each of my dittos is holding, which can potentially swing things in my favor. And two, I will almost always have more Pokemon than my opponent. So like many great generals throughout history, I can overwhelm my opponents with sheer numbers by relentlessly throwing ditto after ditto after ditto at them until they have no choice but to concede defeat. For example, by the time we get to the first fight against my rival Pill, I have four dittos, Blob, Putty, Goop, and Pudding, who can take turns tackling Oshawa until we win the battle. And a similar quote-unquote strategy is what we use to defeat Charon's two normal types. But note here that because we're using carbon copies of his Pokemon, every single turn is a speed tie, meaning that there's a 50-50 chance that we'll get outsped on any given turn. Which does put my dittos in some extremely risky situations. It's only with an Orenberry that Pudding manages to survive with a single hit point to take out Charon's Patrat. Candidly, playing around crits in this playthrough is gonna be pretty tough. But thanks to Pudding's fantastic performance, we We've got three fully healthy dittos to face off against Jaren's Lillipup. So a few turns later, Blob lands the finishing hit, winning us the first gym badge without any casualties. For now, most of the random trainers in Black 2 and White 2 are avoidable, but the few that aren't are usually pretty easy since the enemy AI isn't exactly the most sophisticated piece of programming, but still some of these fights are a nightmare, like the double battle against Leah and Lily's two sun kerns with Growth, Absorb, Grass Weaslay, and Ingrain. Since Ditto only gets 5 PP on each of their moves post-transformation, I have to switch around a lot to reset Absorb PP, which does basically nothing off of sun kerns abysmal special attack stat. The good news is that Ditto also copies an enemy's stat changes, so once Leah and Lily use growth a few times, we do more damage right off the bat instead of having to waste turns going for growth and giving them time to heal back with ingrain or putting us to sleep with grass we slay. This is a pretty painful fight, but we're never in any real danger. Ten minutes later and we've made it to Verbank City, and after collecting our Ditto from Verbank City Complex, we've got to fight the second gym leader, Roxy. I was a bit worried about this fight since her Pokemon don't have have great ways to deal damage to themselves, but that obviously goes both ways, and since Coughing and Whirlipede actually have a worse base HP stat than Ditto, we win this fight pretty handily. As Putty finishes off Whirlipede, it'd be great if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel. It helps me out a lot and lets me know that you want more challenges like this in the future. From here, we're off to the great city of Castelia, a kaleidoscope of loud heartbeats under coats. And also, it's where we can recruit three new dittos to our ever-growing army. Each ditto in our roster has their own unique personality and backstory. They all have a reason for joining the cause, whether that's to find a sense of purpose, leave a troubled past, or provide for their family back home. But really, the only thing that matters is their HP IV. How many hits can they take before going down? As I start to get more and more dittos to choose from, I make the habit of building out my active team of six with four low IV dittos, the privates, who are led by two higher IV ditto commanders. That way, I still have my brightest and best on hand, but if I need to make a sack, the privates are the first to go. It may be cold, callous, and a gross disregard for Dittoian life to reduce each of these young recruits to a single number, but that's war, baby. Some of you may die, but it's a sacrifice. 
I am willing to make. The third gym leader, Berg, is the run's first major threat, since all of his Pokémon have ways to hit themselves for super effective damage. He leads with Swadloon, and all we can do is trade off Strugil Boogles, which is pretty annoying because we both quickly drop to minus 6 special attack and therefore do very little damage. Since Ditto copies all stat changes, not just stat buffs, I can't even reset my own stat drops by switching out. Oh, also, one final Ditto mechanic note in case people are curious, Eviolite doesn't work with Ditto even if they transform into a non-fully evolved Pokémon. So against Swadloon, much like the Sunkern Showdown, this becomes a test of determination, resolve, and dodging critical hits. But ultimately, with enough manpower, we're able to overwhelm Berg and Swadloon goes down. That brings in Dwebble next, who threatens with Smackdown, but since we've got a solid defense stat, I keep Private Jelly in to get off some damage with Razor Leaf. Then I switch in Private Slop for a brutal but necessary sacrifice, because this lets me bring in Commander Pudding at full HP. We tank a Smackdown to get off a Rock Polish, which doubles our speed and guarantees that on the next turn, we can outspeed to land our own Smackdown as Berg now goes for a Rock Polish of his own. And then we win the speed tie to take him out, ensuring that Pudding is at over 50% as Lee Vanny comes out last. With our speed boosts, we can not only outspeed Lee Vanny and land another Hardstone boosted Smackdown, it also baits Berg into going for String Shot instead of doing damage. But on the following turn, now that he outspeeds, a Razor Leaf comes out and leaves Commander Pudding with just one HP after a critical hit. What a king. Another Smackdown triggers Lee Vanny's Citrus Berry, and then it's off to Commander Goop, a personal favorite of mine. With leftovers, they're able to fire off two Strugilbugils to knock out Berg's terrifying ace and win us the battle. But the first Ditoian life has been lost, and unfortunately, this war is just getting started. So Slop's death is merely the beginning. Rest well, my friend. May you find the peace you never had. Hey, speaking of peace, have you ever- Are you really doing an ad segue right now? Can't you see I'm mourning the death of a friend? Have you no shame? What kind of monster would use a moment of silence in honor of a fallen hero to try and segue into a sponsorship? Are there no boundaries which you won't cross, Garchomp FJ? You're- you're right. That- that was insensitive. I'm sorry, Flygon. I'll- I'll just give you the space to mourn. Hey, speaking of space... Oh, what the f- Squarespace is an online platform that helps you build and manage your own website, whether that's an online store for your business or a personal blog for your thoughts. Using their all-in-one platform and customizable templates, it's easy for anyone to create professional and polished websites. Plus, with Squarespace's Fluid Engine design system featuring drag-and-drop technology, you can quickly fine-tune every single detail of your website. For example, I use Squarespace to create Poppy HG.com, the only destination to find curated pictures of my corgi puppy, Poppy. Snow Corgi, aka Snorgi update, we finally got a snowstorm here in Boston and Poppy could not be happier. Squarespace also has a ton of other really useful features to get the most out of your website, like analytic information about the traffic of your website, and Squarespace member areas which can be used to connect with audiences and create exclusive members only content. So if you're looking to start a website for your business or hobby, or corgi, then you should check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your website, you can use my custom link to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get back to the challenge. As we continue our journey, the routes that surround Mbasa City are a great place to find some more young and impressionable dittos to join our cause. Five new dittos take up arms and join our ranks as we head into the electrifying encounter with Elisa. Once again, we have the numbers advantage and we're gonna need it. Her Lita Mulja wins the speed tie and Volt switches out for huge damage into Commander Goop. As Flaffy comes in, we too Volt switch out, but obviously for far less damage. Private Jam takes the stage for a bovine v bovine matchup that requires working through some absolutely absurd RNG. Between the two of us, we miss a comical amount of takedowns and full paralyses run rampant. At least at first, PJ bears the brunt of the bad RNG, going from a full paralysis to a takedown miss to two more full paralyses, all right in a row. Still, through some subsequent misses on Elisa's side, PJ is able to just barely best their doppelganger with 2 HP to spare. But as Zebstrika comes out, PJ's job is done, and they fall to a quick attack, marking death number two. 
In hindsight, that sacrifice was probably unnecessary since we still have four fully healthy dittos, but at the end of the day, Private Jam was never making it back home. In all likelihood, very few dittos will, whether they know it or not. The best they can ask for is an honorable death, and after getting the KO on Flaffy, I'd like to think that PJ got one. Commander Splat comes in to deal with Elisa's grayscale cow, and with charcoal boosted flame charges, we're able to deal solid damage and maintain the speed advantage. But sadly, our enemy Citrus Berry gives them just enough HP to hang on in the red and kill Splat with a flame charge of their own. That's one commanding officer down and three dead dittos total. Private Pudding is free to come in, and even though Elisa heals with a Hyper Potion, they can finally defeat Zeb Stryka and avenge the deaths of PJ and Splat. Amolja comes back out last, and because she has Pursuit, I have to stay in. A quick attack graciously leaves Pudding with just 3 HP, so they're able to Volt Switch out for solid damage. That also means that Private Jelly can safely come in, tank a Volt Switch, and get the last KO of the fight. Elisa's been defeated, and the fourth gym badge is ours. Before we can move on, there's a fight against Heartbreaker Charles on Route 5, which happens to be a rotation battle. The reason this matchup is deceptively tricky is because only the first of my three dittos actively transform. If I rotate to the other two, they're just regular dittos and will need to manually transform. Rotation battles are also completely random, so it's impossible to predict whether Charles will rotate or stay in on any given turn, which isn't fun when both Tirtuga and Archin have a way to hit Sigilyph for super effective damage. Nevertheless, with a bit of luck, things work out, and all six of our dittos barely survive the fight. Which means we've made it to Driftvale City, where we can recruit three more dittos. We can also start farming gems from Chargestone Cave, which will be extremely useful held items going forward. There's a few scary mandatory fights here, including a showdown against ex-Plasma member Rude's Takedown Herdier, and a random gym trainer with a Hone Claws Drillbur and an exploding Baltoy. Rude ends up being no problem, but Private Glob has a pretty rough go against Worker Tavarius's Drillbur. Not only does he immediately immediately lose a speed tie and get flinched by a rock slide, he also proceeds to lose three more speed ties in a row, resulting in the most brutal and, frankly, embarrassing death so far. I wish I could say that Glob's life had an impact, but, uh, clearly it didn't. Fortunately, Commander Goop fares a bit better against the murderous Drillbur, and then the exploding Baltoy proves to be far less imposing than I was anticipating. So with that, we've made it to the fifth gym leader, Clay. And at this point, I've managed to max out the HP EVs of all of my dittos, meaning that our team should be at least somewhat bulkier than most of Clay's Pokemon. Crocorock nails Private Pudding with a Torment before we fire back with a Ground Gem boosted Bulldoze. Unfortunately, thanks to the Torment, we can't get the KO with another, but we can switch to Private Marmalade who's holding an Air Balloon and gets to come in for free. Then by winning the Speed Tie, they can knock the Croc out with a second Bulldoze. Which means Sand Slash comes in next, and not wanting to lose our Air Balloon, I switch to Private Mush on a Crush Claw that gets a pesky defense drop. So I need to switch out to Commander Goop on a second Crush Claw, which gets a second defense drop. Eventually, Sandslash locks himself into rollout for some reason, which lets Private Mush get the kill with a few bulldozes while staying at exactly 50% HP. That's probably not enough to live a hit from Clay's monstrous Exadrill though, so I decide to switch to Private Slosh. Based on the playthrough so far, the enemy AI will never go for a speed reducing move if we're speed tied. They only go for them if we're straight up faster, which is why it was safe to switch Slosh in on the predicted Metal Claw. It's also why I I thought that Slosh was safe to kill Exadrill here with a ground gem boosted bulldoze, but evidently the AI will still go for the speed control move if they see a KO, and since we lose the speed tie, Private Slosh goes down. At the very least, Marmalade's air balloon remains intact, so they're safe to come in and get the kill against Exadrill with two bulldozes, which wins us the battle. But with Slosh's admittedly unnecessary sacrifice, we continue to have as many deaths as we do badges. And before we even have the chance to tip the scale in our favors, we have to enter the Pokemon World Tour, which pits three of my dittos against back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back battles against my rival Pill, Charon, and finally Chorus. A generous level advantage means that this trifecta of fights isn't as deadly as it could be, but without our usual numbers advantage, this has the potential to go very poorly. Against Pill, his lead Daywad is two shot by Revenge, with Commander Goop's leftovers keeping him relatively healthy. Pudding and Mush deal with Simisage, making sure to switch out when they get hit by a Leer and are at risk to a critical hit. 
then Tranquil is handled by my most trusted commander. Pill loves to spam Detect, which helps us stay healthy with Roost and Leftovers, and a well-timed taunt prevents our rival from healing, so a few air cutters seal the deal, and the first fight is done. Charon leads with a beefy Stoutland, and after a few workups, things are looking pretty scary. But those workup boosts will be great for dealing with Charon's final two Pokemon, so I decide to switch to Pudding to copy them. Unfortunately, Stoutland connects with a nasty critical hit tackle on the Switch. And then after Rocky Helmet Chip, our fluffy foe wins the speed tie to snuff out Private Pudding. They've been a fairly active member of the team and had some great performances, so it's sad to see them go. The silver lining is that the Rocky Helmet Chip takes out Stoutland as well, so Sincino comes out as Private Mush replaces their fallen compatriot. Thankfully, Mush wins the speed tie and kills Sincino with a single Fighting Gem boosted wake up slap because we did not want to be on the receiving end of that exchange. With Charon down to Watch Hog, another wake up slap is enough for the KO, so we're off to the finals of the PWT with just Private Mush and Commander Goo. Fortunately, Chorus's Magneton proves to be the proper counter to the rest of his team. Their Magnet Pull ability means that we can't switch out, so we're risking some full paralyses and or confusions from Supersonic, but leftovers and some good luck with speed ties, plus snapping out of confusion early, ensures that Commander Goop can knock out their double with nearly full HP. So they then easily finish off LGM and Clink, winning us the battle against Chorus and the entire PWT. Yay! Dittos from Route 7 and Celestial Tower join the roster just in time to face off against Skyla and her flying types. Things start off well as we manage to win the speed tie against her Swoobat and land a flying gem boosted acrobatics, though it falls just shy of the KO. As a result, we get hit by an Assurance, and since Skyla heals, we need to win a second speed tie to avoid additional damage which we do not, but at least Jello still wins the matchup. As Swana comes out, I bring in Private Gumbo. An Air Slash does 57 damage, exactly 50% of our HP, so I decide to switch to Jelly, who has just a bit more bulk, ensuring that we should live a second hit. I go for a Roost to see if Swana will miss or just go for a Feather Dance, but she does neither. On the following turn, our enemy wins the speed tie, leaving us with 22 HP after another Air Slash before we retaliate with our own, boosted by another Flying Gem. Then, it's a switch to Private Dollop, who also takes less than 50% of their HP from an Air Slash, so I guess that first one was just a very high roll. Unfortunately, we once again lose the speed tie, but Dollop lives, doesn't get flinched, and lands a kill on Skyla's ace with another Flying Gem boosted Air Slash. All that's left then is Skarmory, but after healing back some HP with Roost, Dollop is safe to get the KO with two Bubble Beams and win us the first Deathless Gym Badge since Roxy. So, as we fly off to Lentimos Town, we're back to an equal number of gym badges and deaths. But we can kiss that competition goodbye because Reversal Mountain is hell on earth for our ditto army. In the depths of this stupid pile of rocks are some extremely challenging, unavoidable battles. The first is a forced multi-battle against Hiker Jared and Backpacker Kumiko. Based on the positioning of the field, I'm forced to transform into Kumiko's dumb Golbat, which fares quite poorly into Jared's Bulldor. Thinking that Bianca's Musharna will just Psychic Golbat, I figure that my best play is to nail Bulldor with a Confuse Ray, but that proves to be a misplay since Musharna knows Energy Ball and brings Bulldor down to his sturdy. So, as Bulldor breaks through Confusion, I have no one to blame but myself for Gumbo's death. Private Jello comes in next and manages to win the speed tie to nail both of our enemies with a Swift, which obviously finishes off Bulldor. Doesn't do much to Golbat, though, who at the very least decides to target down Musharna this time. She then retaliates with a Psychic that clears the other side of the field, but those were the easy Pokemon, because out come Darmanitan and Exodrill. I switch to Dollop, who's forced to transform into Darmanitan. Then our enemies nail Musharna with a critical hit Flare Blitz for a KO, followed by a single target Rock Slam slide that Dollop just barely survives. Bianca brings in Mianfu, who turns out to be pretty damn helpful because she immediately uses Fake Out to flinch Darmanitan, ensuring that Dollop can cleanly kill Exadrill with a Flare Blitz. Of course, the recoil takes us out as well, so that's two dittos dead in Reversal Mountain. PJ's free to come in and finish off Darmanitan with a Thrash, which means we've won this miserable multi-battle, but there's still one more. At the very least, we can separate this into two single battle fights which I thought would be a bit more manageable. Unfortunately, Ace Trainer Korra has a Grumpig and a Drift Blim, the latter of which can hit both Grumpig and itself for super effective damage with X. By patiently stalling out Korra's Grumpig with switches and rest, I'm able to knock her out at nearly full HP, which puts me in a good position to deal with Drift Blim. 
Or so I thought. She outspeeds and Power Gem is just barely not enough for the two-hit kill, so I have to switch out. Sadly, when Jelly comes in, we see the limits of Ditto's 48 base HP, as Hex does a massive amount of damage. Pokemon with huge HP stats like Drifblim are a real problem for Ditto, since even with max HP EVs, we can't match that level of bulk. Unfortunately, there's nothing else I can do but hope that Jelly wins the speed tie, which they do not. Neither does Private Jello, who was damaged during the Grumpig stall sesh and therefore also goes down. Graciously, Commander Goop comes in to save the day, and by winning their speed tie, Driftblim falls and the battle is won. Though since it again costs the life of two dittos, our death total is officially in the double digits. Thankfully, the final mandatory fight of Reversal Mountain is a breeze, with Private Mash being able to one-shot Vibrava with a Dragon Gem boosted Dragon Breath, and then getting the KO against Camera Up with two Earth Powers. With that all out of the way, we can begin the long trek to Opelucid City, which has surprisingly few mandatory fights, none of which are particularly difficult. This stretch of the game also allows me to recruit many, many more soldiers. By the time we've made it to our destination, the roster has exploded to include 19 dittos, which is great because the Opelucid Gym is a nightmare. Before even getting to Drayden, we gotta face down against three gym trainers who all have dragon types that can one-shot themselves. Most of these matchups just come down to whether or not I win the speed tie. The potential number of deaths here is astronomical. All I can do is throw out privates and hope for the best. The first fight against veteran Lucius goes as well as it can. Even though we do lose the speed tie, he wastes a turn going for taunt, so we take the kill with a dragon gem boosted dragon claw. Easy peasy. The second fight is a choice between the defensive player Rona and the offensive player Jerry. I opt for Rona, and whether or not that's technically the right choice, this fight plays out beautifully. Despite again losing the speed tie, Rona nails us with a swagger, which boosts our attack and confuses us. Fortunately, Private Slush breaks through the confusion to set up a substitute. Then, they immediately snap out of confusion and kill Fracture with a dual chop. Our enemies holding a Haban Berry here to have the damage of super effective dragon type attacks, which would obviously be a great item for us to have in this situation, but in Black 2 and White 2, the damage reducing berries are locked behind the communication features of Join Avenue, which I generally do not allow in my Nuzlocke playthroughs, since even though they are technically accessible, it would require some, uh, help from Uncle Jintendo to get them. Anyways, Private Slush's extraordinary performance against Rona means that we've made it to the final mandatory gym trainer without any deaths. Once again, it's a choice between two different fights, a triple battle against Ron or a rotation battle against Danae. I go with the rotation battle since fighting against one Pokemon at any given time sounds much easier. Danae's lead is Drudagon and Slush immediately continues their streak of dominance by winning the speed tie and getting a clean KO with Dragon Claw. Fracture gets rotated in as a replacement, but then Danae rotates again to Axew, who outspeeds and nails Slush with a Dragon Claw that barely doesn't get the KO so Slush can retaliate with their own Dragon Claw, which does. But with Fracture as the final Pokemon, there's nothing to be done. Slush is slower and switching out is pointless since a Dragon Claw from Fracture will kill each and every one of my Pokemon. So despite an all-star performance throughout this gym, Private Slush finally goes down. Rest in peace, soldier. Your actions today saved the lives of a ton of your teammates. Well, sorta. I mean, like I said, there's literally nothing I can do against this Fracture but hope to win the speed tie, and sadly, Private Splotch does not, so they two go down. But Puree gets lucky and outspeeds, meaning that their Dragon Claw gets the KO before we lose any more soldiers. Mind you, that's two deaths in the Opelucid Gym before even getting to the Gym Leader, who is of course a massive problem. All three of Drayden's Pokemon know Dragon Tail, a negative priority move that forces out the enemy a la Roar or Whirlwind. Normally, this move actually makes Drayden easier since it has atrocious synergy with Dragon Dance on his Haxorus, but in this playthrough, it's pretty horrible because it means that if both of us go for Dragon Tail and I lose the speed tie, I get forced out before I can attack. Y you know, assuming I even survive the hit. This fight has the potential to be a disaster, but things get off to a great start as Drayden's Drudagon goes for revenge instead of Dragon Tail. This means that Private Mash simply shrugs off the hit and then nails our foe with a super effective Dragon Gem boosted Dragon Tail. It's not quite enough for the KO, but it does immediately bring in Haxorus, which believe it or not is a good thing. Now though, I've got no choice but to let Mash go down. This lets Private Batter come in next and copy Drayden's ultimate weapon. 
For whatever reason, Drayden opts for Assurance, which does basically nothing, and lets Batter kill Haxorus with another Dragon Gem boosted Dragon Tail. And since Haxorus outspeeds Drayden's next Pokemon, Flygon, we can stay in, conveniently dodge a Rock Slide, and then whack him with yet another Dragon Tail. This surprisingly doesn't get the KO, but it does send him out and bring in Drudigon. Drayden heals with a Hyper Potion, and Batter awkwardly misses their third Dragon Tail, but it ends up being fine because Drudigon simply hits us with another Soft Revenge before our fourth Dragon Tail connects. Once again, it's not a kill, but now both Pokemon are so low that we can nail them with a Slash apiece, winning us the seventh Gym Badge of the run. Honestly, only one death is about as good of a result as I could have asked for. It also means that we've got a few more dittos on reserve than expected as we head into one of the longer late games in the franchise. Team Plasma is here to stir up trouble via a seemingly endless number of mandatory fights against random grunts and mini-bosses. None of the matchups in Opelucid City prove to be particularly difficult, so I can pretty quickly make my way to Humalau City where I catch four more dittos and square off against Marlin for the eighth gym badge. He leads with Caracosta, and once again I lose the speed tie, but I'll gladly take that if it means burning Caracosta with a water gem boosted Scald, which conveniently puts him in the red and forces Marlin to heal with a Hyper Potion. This lets me go for a Shell Smash for free, guaranteeing that we move first and get the KO with a second Scald on the following turn. That really could not have gone any better, but as has often been the case in this playthrough, one strong performance does not save a life. And here, Private Wad must make the ultimate sacrifice, because even at plus two, a smackdown only does about 50% to Marlin's big fat fish before he retaliates with a nasty scald for the kill. Remember the issue with Drift Blim, how we were significantly less bulky because of how much lower our HP stat is? Well, that's a thousand times more the case with Whale Lord, who's like 90% HP. Fun fact, with Ditto's base HP, Whale Lord has a lower base stat total than every single regional bug type Pokemon. So needless to say, we are extremely outgunned here. And it doesn't help that we lose like a million speed ties as Marlin spams bounce. Like Marlin manages to outspeed and spring up when I'm going for a single turn attack, but he also underspeeds at the exact right time when we're both in the air so that I miss my bounce, come down and then get hit by his bounce. It's extremely frustrating and so much of this game being dependent on speed ties is starting to make me lose my mind and patience. Ultimately, I have to bring in Play-Doh, who comes in on a Scald after Waylord has run out of Bounce PP. And then, after losing one final speed tie, of course, we can get the KO with a Scald. But that brings in Jellicent, who also has a massive HP stat, and he outspeeds to kill Play-Doh with a single Ominous Wind. So it's time for Glue to come in and immediately lose yet another speed tie. At least their curse body activates so Jellicent can no longer use Ominous Wind, though that doesn't actually matter because we managed to retaliate with our own Ghost Gem boosted Ominous Wind, which thanks to a crit gets a clean KO. So Marlin's been defeated and the final gym badge is ours. But now the Team Plasma stuff really kicks into high gear. And there are a lot of difficult fights here, though maybe not the ones that you would expect. A double up during a multi-battle with my rival sees the death of one of our most recent recruits, Private Tar. Anything that's not a straightforward single battle has a pretty high chance of being a catastrophe since there's so many things that can go wrong. And nothing better exemplifies that than the ambush double battle against these two random grunts. These assholes have three Pokemon each, including a Scrafty with f***ing high jump kick, which in case you don't know, is a 130 base power fighting type move. This means that Scrafty will be able to very easily kill my dittos if we lose any speed ties. Since Scrafty is on the left side, my best bet is to first kill the Trubbish on the right side so that the Grunt brings in their Golbat. This will let me outspeed and hit Scrafty for super effective damage with Acrobatics, but the downside is that Golbat can easily kill my left side of the field with Acrobatics as well. On the first turn though, my enemy doubles up on Glue with Acrobatics and Crunch, but then we lose the speed tie and the Golbat kills Batter. We get the revenge kill with an acrobatics of our own, and then somehow Glue actually manages to hang on from a crunch with 1 HP. The right-sided Grunt then brings in Garbodor, and I bring in Marmalade. Hoping that Garbodor will just go for the kill on Marmalade, I target down Scraggy with an Acrobatics, but sadly he just takes the kill on Glue, which means that after Marmalade hits a Limp Dick Facade, I bring in Private Blob, my very first ditto, to face off against Scrafty and Garbodor. Marmalade's got to switch into Puree, who at full HP can barely survive a high jump kick. Garbodor generously just goes for Sludge Bomb into Blob, which means we can hit Scrafty with a Poison Gem boosted Sludge Bomb for not even 50 
50%. Then Pire does indeed barely tank a high jump kick so that Scrafty doesn't get a moxie boost. Our held Rocky Helmet also does some decent chip. I switch Pire into Globule as Garbodor once again goes for a Sludge Bomb into Blob. Our Sludge Bomb then brings Scrafty into the red before she doubles up on our commander to bring him into the yellow. With that, Blob finally wins a speed tie and kills the pesky Scrafty with a Sludge Bomb. The enemy Garbodor yet again just goes for a resisted Sludge Bomb into Blob, so as Private Globule fires off a strong crunch and the Plasma Grunt sends in his final Pokemon Whirlipede, it looks like we've got things under control. A switch to Marmalade to save Blob's life, followed by a crunch into Garbodor, and then a facade into Whirlipede on the following turn, wins us the unreasonably difficult double battle against these two stupid grunts. Compared to that, the remaining mini-boss fights are a walk in the park. Colrus is shockingly easy given how difficult his team can be in certain playthroughs, but just like in the PWT, his Pokemon are pretty great answers to themselves. Once he brings in Kling Clang, we can paralyze them with Thunder Wave, steal their shift gear boosts for ourselves, and then sweep the rest of his team. How we lost two dittos in that double battle against no-name grunts, but zero dittos against Colrus is beyond me. Next are the fights against the Shadow Triad, but by intentionally activating their Ponyard's Defiant ability with Scary Face, and then copying those stats by switching out, while simultaneously baiting them to hit us with Scary Face again, I can get my Imposter Ponyard to plus four attack and sweep through the rest of their Pokemon. A Selgor does come dangerously close to getting a KO, but Ponyard prevails and we're off to easily the most challenging fight of the playthrough so far, the showdown against Kiram Black and and gets this. this fight is going to require a lot of sacrifices. So instead of going with my usual four private, two commander formation, I've got a full team of six privates ready to lay down their lives for eternal glory. The strategy for beating Kurem Black is simple win the speed tie. On the first turn, we do not, though since Kiram fails to get a crit or a paralysis, it means that Private Globule is free to counter with their own Dragon Breath for over 50%. But now, winning the speed tie is crucial. Come on, Globule, you got this. Let's go, buddy! Globule wins the speed tie and takes out the terrifying legendary. We've bested Getsus' first line of offense, but now we've got to beat his team of six absolute beasts. He starts with Kofagrigus, who wins the speed tie but misses Toxic, which is pretty lucky on our part because we managed to connect with our own Toxic, which can rack up damage as we go for Protect. But that proves to be meaningless, because Private Globule, the legend killer, shows that they mean business by winning the following speed tie and one-shotting Kofagrigus with a critical hit Shadow Ball. We're off to a great start, folks. Electros gets baited in next, so I stay in to tank a Crunch and connect with another Toxic. Since the Crunch lowered our defense, I have to switch to Private Blob on a resisted Acrobatics. Then it's just a Crunch off, though frustratingly our enemy's poison damage drops them into the red, causing Getsis to heal with a full restore. So, as a result, my very first ditto, recruited from Aspersia City so long ago, just doesn't have enough juice to beat their doppelganger, falling short of the KO and going down to one final crunch. Private Globule comes back out and unfortunately loses another speed tie before being able to take out Electros. So, as Seismitoad comes out third, Globule goes down to a muddy water, leaving us with four dittos to deal with Getsis's four remaining monstrosities. I send in Private Marmalade next, who immediately gets outsped and crit by an Earthquake. Not what you want to see, especially since our Earthquake only does about 50%, but at the very least we win the next speed tie, so Marmalade manages to come out on top. Of course, they're now a sitting duck against Drapion, who easily outspeeds and kills our third ditto with Night Slash. So it's Private Putty time. We exchange Earthquakes, with ours being boosted by a Ground Gem, though that's still not enough for the one-shot. On the next turn, Putty loses the speed tie, so a second Earthquake takes them out, leaving me with just two dittos left. And things aren't looking great as Pire loses another speed tie, meaning they eat an Earthquake before getting the KO. As Hydreigon comes out fifth for Getsis, all hope seems lost. This Life Orb boosted menace will outspeed and easily kill Pure with Dragon Rush, but he misses! Which lets Pure hit him with an X Scissor, though that really doesn't do much damage, and then Hydreigon connects with a Dragon Rush on the following turn anyways, so Pure goes down. Which means that it's all up to Private Gunk. 
the final ditto. If we win this speed tie, a dragon rush will easily kill Hydreigon. If we don't, we're almost certainly dead and looking at a wipe. But Gunk outspeeds, and with a needless dragon gem boost to dragon rush, they kill Getsus' malevolent ace. All that's left is Toxicroak, so Private Gunk's got this. That brutal miss means that Toxicroak can nail Gunk with a super effective Brick Break. It's not enough for the kill, but unfortunately Dragon Rush isn't enough for a one-shot. Theoretically, we could flinch Toxicroak here, but Gunk just misses again, so Poison Jab kills my sixth and final ditto, meaning that we've lost the battle. But it doesn't mean we've lost the war. Now normally, a wipe constitutes a failed run in my book. But in this playthrough, we've still got 10 dittos in the PC healthy and ready to avenge their siblings. So, after depositing the bodies of our fallen soldiers, I cobble together a new team of six and head back to the depths of Giant Chasm for a rematch against Getsis. This time, we're fueled by vengeance, and unlike before, Kiram Black has already been defeated, so my lead ditto, Private Splooge, can be better prepared for Getsus' Kofagrigus by holding a Pecha Berry. With this tech, we can simply two-shot our enemy with Shadow Ball and stay at full HP while doing it, thanks to winning the all-important second speed tie. Against Electros, I immediately switch Splooge out into Private Clump. With a Dark Gem boosted Crunch, I try to outdamage our enemy, but Getsis still manages to heal his stupid eel with a full restore. One of our crunches gets a lucky defense drop, which lets Clump bring Electros all the way down into the red, but then they fall to a flamethrower. So, Private Porridge comes in next, and by winning a speed tie, they take out Electros with a flamethrower, which means we're at full HP, as Seismitoad comes in third. So, we can stay in to tank a Muddy Water, which does less than 50%, and then fire off a Dark Gem Boosted Crunch that manages to get another lucky defense drop, which means a second attack will get the KO, but Seismitoad hits us with another Muddy Water, which gets an accuracy drop that causes Porridge to miss their acrobatics. Unlucky, but sometimes that's just how it goes. Porridge falls and Private Splooge comes back out, determined to tip the RNG scales back in our favor by winning the speed tie and landing a critical hit earthquake for the kill. Splooge has taken two kills and not lost a single tick of HP, though that's about to change as Drapion comes in and nails us with a nasty Night Slash. We can fire off a strong earthquake, but since it's not enough for the KO, I decide to switch Splooge out into Private Soup, who shrugs off a second Night Slash. With yet another speed tie win, we finish off Drapion, and Leftovers bring Soup back to nearly full HP. So we now have four dittos left to deal with Getsus' final two Pokemon, double the numbers that we had in our previous match. Soup can now tank a Dragon Rush, which lets them hit Hydreigon with an X Scissor. Sadly, even with Leftovers recovery, they cannot tank another and fall on the following turn. By this point, Life Orb Chip has brought Hydreigon down pretty low, but we're still gonna need to connect with a Dragon Rush to get the kill here. I bring in Private Gelatin first, but Getsis outspeeds and connects with a third Life Orb boosted Dragon Rush for a clean KO. Another 10% from Life Orb Chip means that we should now be able to get the KO with a Rock Slide from Splooge, but it doesn't matter because we lose the speed tie again, and Hydreigon connects with a fourth Dragon Rush. So just like that, I'm down to one final ditto, Private Grits. The last few turns against Hydreigon have been brutal, but Grits manages to pull it together and win the speed tie to knock out our enemy with a Rock Slide. All we gotta do now then is kill Toxicroak, but that oily bastard dodges Dragon Rush again. And not that it really matters since playing for the flinch is pretty unlikely anyways, but our fourth Dragon Rush misses as well, resulting in a nearly identical wipe. I'm not sure if viewers find it interesting when I go on tangents about the statistical likelihood of bad RNG, but the odds of losing two speed ties, Hydreigon connecting with four Dragon Rushes, and us missing two is a lovely 0.49%. Sometimes Pokemon is a stupid, stupid game. Well, with 30 dittos dead, I've only got four left. They are some of my best, sure, but even if we can beat Getsis, there's no chance we're making it through the rest of this playthrough. At this point, I was convinced that the dream was dead and the run was over. Until I remembered that I had skipped over a few potential encounters. Relic Castle, and Zorua in Driftvale City, and the Guidance Chamber in Mistralton Cave. 
With those encounters, I'm able to cobble together yet another full team of six, and with the few additional encounters I'll be able to get on the way to the Pokemon League, we might have just enough manpower to take a crack at the Elite Four. But I'm getting ahead of myself because we do still need to beat Getsis, which is proving to be even harder than I had ever anticipated. We can't afford another full-blown wipe against this dude, and banking on decent RNG clearly isn't a winning strategy. So, I'm gonna need to bring out my secret weapon, the Choice Scarf. With held Choice Scarfs, my dittos will always be able to outspeed their doppelgangers at the expense of getting locked into a single move. The problem, and the reason I didn't do this sooner, is that Choice Scarfs can only be purchased with battle points from the PWT. Since farming BP is not exactly risk-free, my personal rule set bans the use of these items in typical Nuzlocks, even via Uncle Jintendo's oh, special methods. But this isn't a typical Nuzlocke. We've lost 30 dittos. Desperate times call for desperate measures. My goal was to at least make it to the Elite Four before having to resort to using these items, but I also didn't anticipate losing 12 soldiers to Getsis. So alas. With our new team assembled and most of them scarfed up, it's time for one last crack at Getsis. His lead Kofagrigus is again a simple two-shot with Shadow Ball, this time from Private Bile. Against Electros, I decide to go for a Toxic like in the first fight. Then Private Curd swaps in and starts spamming Crunch. With our Choice Scarf, we're guaranteed to outspeed, so despite another heal via Full Restore, we're able to eke out the win. Against Seismitoad, I swap back out into Bile on a Muddy Water. Since they don't have a Choice Scarf, Seismitoad wins the speed tie and kills us with an Earthquake, marking our 31st death. Private Plop comes in next and starts firing off Earthquakes, but without a Choice Scarf, Seismitoad is able to land two more hits before going down. Electing to save Plop for better odds into Hydreigon if we need it, I switch to Private Mush on a Night Slash that crits, doing triple damage thanks to Drapion's sniper ability. A Choice Scarf means we can fire off one Earthquake, but then Drapion connects with a second critical hit, which is more than enough to get the kill. Great. Well, Commander Mochi comes in and thankfully outspeeds to kill Drapion with another Earthquake, meaning that they're at full HP as the pesky Hydreigon takes the field. And then a Dragon Rush miss means that Mochi can fire off an X Scissor and effectively ensures us the win. Because even though Hydreigon connects with a Dragon Rush on the following turn, the Life Orb chip easily puts him in range to a second X Scissor, unless we flinch. But before I can get too pissy, Hydreigon does miss another Dragon Rush, which means that Mochi can take the kill with a second X Scissor. We've done it! We've freaking done it! Toxicroak falls to two Earthquakes from Mochi, and at long last, the battle against Getsis has been won. The world is saved, and we are officially on our way to the Pokemon League. With encounters from Route 23 and Victory Road, we can replace the two dittos we lost against Getsis and still have one in the box on reserve. The final push to the Pokemon League is pretty brutal. There are some frustratingly tricky trainers on Victory Road, and clearly they have no intention of making this easy on me. The fight against the very first trainer, Billy, nearly ends in total disaster as his Sigalith manages to freeze my ditto with Ice Beam twice but we do manage to make it out of that fight without any casualties. Though the same cannot be said about the fights against the final two veterans. Portia's Sock sets up a few bulk ups and then lands a critical hit against Curd, so there's nothing I can do about that. Sterling's Golurk always comes out after his throw, and since throw can't hit Golurk for damage with anything other than Rock Tomb, there's literally nothing I can do here but switch out, forcing one of my dittos to take a hit on the switch. And since our Shadow Punch isn't a one-shot, we're all but guaranteed to lose a soldier here. Which means that I've only got five dittos left as I face off against my rival for the final time. He leads with Unpheasant, and I immediately win a speed tie to hit him with a facade. He then goes for Swagger, giving Private Clay a free attack boost since our held Personberry cures the confusion. A lucky speed tie win on the following turn means that we can kill Unpheasant with another facade, immediately bringing in Pills a Samurai. I stay in to nail him with a plus two facade, but that sadly doesn't even do 50% before an Ice Beam brings Clay down to 35 HP. 
With only five dittos left, I can't afford any deaths, so I'd nail him with a U-turn and bring in Commander Gumdrop, who shrugs off a revenge, especially with their held leftovers. Hill uses a max potion here, so we gotta start back from square one. We trade off attacks for a few turns until Samurok goes down and Bufalant comes in third. The goal here is to switch around and let Bufalant rack up recoil damage as we retaliate with additional damage when we have the chance. It works out pretty well with Commander Goop being able to take the kill a few turns later, but we still have to deal with Simisage and only Commander Mochi remains at full HP. They take some damage from an energy ball on the switch and then start firing off crunches. Our second one gets a defense drop, so it actually looks like Mochi has this in the bag until Simisage lands a critical hit crunch. Well, Goop is free to come in and finish off Simisage, which means that we've won the battle and can limp our way to the Pokemon League with a whopping 35 deaths and four remaining dittos. But believe it or not, there are still a few encounters I've overlooked. I can catch a Pokemon in the Abundant Shrine, and Hidden Grottoes are technically their own encounter location, so we just barely have enough dittos to build out a full team of six. Actually, I'm only now realizing while writing the script that I could have also surfed in Verbank City, but that didn't cross my mind at the time, and isn't it more poetic to have exactly the number of dittos needed? Here's my final team of six, all leveled up to the level cap of 58. I'm gonna be honest, folks. I think the Pokemon League is nearly impossible. If you haven't noticed, we've been losing dittos in almost every major fight for a while now, so I don't have a whole lot of faith that six dittos are gonna be able to beat four separate Elite Four teams and then Iris's team. But we've made it this far, so I'll be damned if I'm not gonna give it my all. For our 35 fallen brethren, Let's do this. First up is Caitlyn, who leads with Musharna. Private Plop is holding a Chesto Berry to avoid getting put to sleep with Yawn so that they can hopefully score a quick kill with some charge beams after the special attack boosts. But that proves to be a fruitless endeavor since we get barely any boosts and Musharna is far too bulky anyways. So instead, we need to methodically stall Musharna out of her PP by switching between my dittos. One eternity later. It takes over 10 minutes and we lose a lot of HP in the process, but the end result is that Plop is boosted up as they knock out Musharna Sharna with a Dream Eater and get back to a respectable amount of HP. Sigalith comes in second and lands a super effective Shadow Ball, but Plop hangs on to get a clean kill with Charge Beam, which needlessly crits since we're at like plus five special attack. Gothitelle is third, so I switch to one of my two fully healthy dittos, Private Clay, who tanks the hit well enough. They then use their Choice Scarf to outspeed and connect with a Shadow Ball of our own. Unfortunately, it's not enough for a two-shot, so we gotta switch out to my final healthy ditto, Private Paste. A switch in on a Psychic is nice because it means that Paste is a bit healthier than I was expecting as two more Shadow Balls take the KO. All that's left is Caitlyn's Reuniclus, but we've got a huge problem since Shadow Ball is not nearly enough for the two-shot. Paste lives one energy ball, but they're dead to a second, meaning that I gotta switch out. Commander Gumdrop comes in, but now that we're a Reuniclus, we don't have a way to hit our enemy for super effective damage. Since we have Choice Scarf, I'm locked into using one move, so my best bet is to spam Energy Ball and hope for a special defense drop or two. I can switch out when Commander Gumdrop is about to die, but since all of my other dittos except Private Plop have Choice Scarf, all I can do is spam Energy Ball and hope for the best. Well, actually, that's not true. After a while, I realized that my best bet is to actually spam Recover to stall Reuniclus out of all of her moves. Unfortunately, I realize it just a tad too late, and because I have to switch out Private Flubber to reset my Recover PP, Commander Goop, our oldest ditto, and my personal favorite goes down. That's a brutal death especially because it was entirely avoidable with a slightly better plan. Nevertheless, we can now successfully stall out Reuniclus by having two of my Choice Scarf Dittos spam Recover. Then, a short 15 minutes later, Reuniclus struggles herself to death and the battle is won. But losing one of my six Dittos to Caitlyn is pretty unideal since she's probably the easiest member of the Elite Four. I go for Marshall next, who leads with Throw, an extremely frustrating Pokemon to deal with since they're so dang bulky. The only thing I can do is spam Bulldozes to bait them into going for speed reduction moves themselves. Private Plop has leftovers, so we can tank far more attacks this way, and after a few turns, I go for a Storm Throw, hoping to snipe off our enemy before he heals. Sadly, it comes up just short. 
so it's not long before Plop has to switch out to Private Flubber, who's able to finally get the KO with two more Storm Throws. That brings in Mien Xiao, who I'm hoping will just go for Bounce as I bring in Commander Gumdrop, but he elects for a nasty high jump kick, which leaves us with 9 HP. Thank Arceus for Gumdrop's high HP IV, because we can outspeed and one-shot Mien Xiao with a high jump kick of our own, which brings in Conkeldur third. I can't lose another ditto, so I gotta switch to paste on a hammer arm that manages to miss, which is frankly insanely lucky, because now we're safe to use our held choice scarf to nail Conkeldur with our own hammer arm for about 50%, though a citrus berry means another one won't get the KO. So after tanking a hit, I switch to private Clay, who's not holding a choice scarf. This means that they're able to set up a bulk up to raise their attack and defense, which lets them barely survive a second hammer arm. So with the speed advantage on the following turn, a fighting gem boost boosted hammer arm is now more than enough to get the kill on Conkeldur. I'm pretty proud of being able to find that bulk up strat, but unfortunately, we just don't have the numbers to be able to properly deal with Marshall's final Pokemon Sock. He's too strong, and my Pokemon are far too damaged. A switch to Flubber on a boosted Retaliate instantly kills our 37th ditto. Paste can nail Sock with a Brick Break, but with his sturdy ability, Sock is guaranteed to get off another Brick Break and take his second KO. So, as Commander Gumdrop comes in to finish off Sock and win the battle, we've got just three dittos left to deal with two members of the Elite Four and the Champion. Feeling deflated, I decide to take on Chantel third. Her ghost types all hit each other for super effective damage, so this is pretty tricky. Her Kofagrigus wins the speed tie, but simply goes for a Will-O-Wisp, which lets us retaliate with a choice spec Shadow Ball for a clean KO. Drift Blim comes in second and nails Private Plop with a Shadow Ball of their own, but we tank the hit and fire back with another one shot. Against Chandelure, I switch out to Gumdrop, who lucks out and only has to tank a resisted Fire Blast. Then with our Choice Scarf, we can outspeed and get the one shot. And then another Shadow Ball is enough to kill Golurk. So miraculously, we've actually managed to beat Chantel without losing any Pokemon. That is exactly what we needed, but frankly, it's just not enough, because Grimsley's team is a pretty big issue. By losing the speed tie on the fake out turn, Plop doesn't have enough juice to kill Liopard before Grimsley heals with a full restore. So even with Leftover's recovery, she goes down before getting the KO. Clay can come in and finish off the cat, but that immediately brings out Bisharp, which we simply cannot deal with. At least not with only two dittos. X-Scissors does no damage, and she's holding a Citrus Berry. Commander Gumdrop can get her into the yellow before going down, and Clay can finish her off, but that brings out Scrafty, who can easily tank an X-Scissor and kill my final ditto with a Brick Break. With that, the run is officially over, and I have failed. In another life, maybe I didn't lose a ditto against Caitlyn, and maybe I only lost one ditto against Marshall. And thinking about it a little, I might have been able to beat the Grimsley fight by switching out my dittos before they died, sacking one of them to Scrafty to get the Moxie boost, and then copying that boost for a reverse sweep, but I don't even know if plus one Brick Break kills Scrafty, and even with a Choice Scarf, Crocodile would probably still outspeed us, so whatever. Regardless, it does seem like the Elite Four actually is technically possible, albeit extremely luck dependent. And with a little more luck, it might even be possible to beat Iris, since her lead Hydreigon has a decent matchup against the rest of her team. So maybe someone can do this challenge. As for me, this is as far as I go. At least for now. 41 dead dittos is more than enough for one lifetime. It breaks my heart that we weren't able to honor their deaths with a victory, but just because we ultimately lost the run doesn't mean that our adventure was pointless. Each and every ditto did their best. They gave everything they had and left it all out on the battlefield. At the end of the day, sometimes you just don't have what it takes. Sometimes you need to accept what you are and what you aren't. It's a harsh lesson, but we live in a harsh world. And in a way, there's a weird sort of comfort in accepting your limits, understanding what's out of your control, and learning to appreciate what you can control. You can't control whether you're born a ditto, but you can control how you use the time you're given and the company you keep. Despite our final failure, I'm proud of my ditto army. 
Hopefully our journey inspires someone watching to try the unthinkable and dare to dream regardless of the outcome. And if not that, then maybe my failure provided you with some morbid entertainment. If it did, consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel. Stay tuned for more Nuzlocke content, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.